Ladies and gentlemen, Pete Townsend and Eric Clapton. <laughs> Thank you. I, uh, I never understood why you didn't electrocute yourself when you did that. <laughs> well, there's, no, there's no, no juice going through a guitar. No, no proper electricity. You didn't unplug it there? No. And was it always your best guitar? It was always whatever was in my hands at the time. And you did it two nights ago, I gather, at a concert this week. Yeah, Roger, Roger left the stage because he... Uh, it, not in the middle of the show, but towards the end of the show, because he uh, had a dreadfully bad voice and he was feeling very humiliated and we were in the we did won't get fooled again in which his presence was sadly missed so I thought I'd smash a guitar to try and make up for it it was pathetic <laughs> <laughs> you it lost took me a long act. time I used these guitars that Eric designed actually it's the Eric Clapton model and uh, they're pretty tough Yes, very Take strong. Take some smashing. Yeah. That hair was pretty tough. Did you see it on that, that <laughs> clip? That pretty good my, now, isn't it? My tribute to Jimi Hendrix, actually. <laughs> yeah. One, it, was like, it was real, wasn't it? One of the first poems in it London. It was real. <laughs> one of the first poems in London. It looked like a wig. That <laughs> was the poem. And a big chiffon scarf. Steady on. There's two of us. <laughs> Did you have the pink high heel boots on the other That's end? right, yes. Yeah. Mm. Have, have you still got them? I don't think so. I think they fell apart. You still got the Paisley flares. Who me? I never wore Paisley flares. Yeah, you did. No, you no, did? I, I, uh, I remember. No, I didn't wear <laughs> Paisley flares. I'm I, as ancient as you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I don't. I don't think I wore Paisley flares. I think I had a, what we did wear, which were actually really rather splendid, were these jackets that you could buy at a place called Granny Takes a Trip in the King's Road, and I still they were sort of brocade jackets, very beautifully made actually, and. Uh, you see groups sometimes wearing them today, and you, know, you see young bands, very, very young bands, guys where, you know, the, the guitar players might be 15 or 16, and they manage to find these old things in Oxfam shops. And uh, Vivian, they want to look cool. like, you know, they want to have that kind of psychedelic look. It's very brief, wasn't it, psychedelia? Yeah. About six months a year. drug war off, I think. <laughs> <laughs> mm. But it's 25 years on, as we keep reminding you, and still you're both pulling in the audiences by the thousand. Why do they come? How do you explain it then? Uh, I think it's because we're superior musicians. <laughs> well, I'm joking. Well, they took you seriously with that. <laughs> no, we'll never hear the end of it, right? No, but I just think that the people that actually survived the, the rigors of the 60s, the early 60s, and then the 70s, which were even tougher for me, um, to get through that, you had to have something in reserve. And at these days, it's become so much more corporate, the whole thing, that people don't really learn to play the hard way. You know, they're, they're in and out so quickly, or mm. they're, they're discovered and then forgotten so quickly, that people aren't really doing it for good anymore. Right? Is there That's anybody what... you admire on the current scene? Yeah, lots of groups I like a lot, but I don't know what sort of lifespan they'll have. You also never really know what's going on in the background. You never really know whether it's them or their skill at production, or their skill at manipulating music, rather than actually playing it. And I think that one of the things... It's not to say that I think it, that I feel that, that, that it's superior to be able to perform. I think performing is one thing that some people do, and writing music is one thing that other people do, and producing records is yet another. But we are expected to perform. We're expected to go on and perform live. And I, uh, this tour that The Who did last year was the first time I performed for ages, and I went back to it quite naturally. I don't feel comfortable with it, but I can do it. And I think some of the new artists maybe can perform miracles in the studio, but you don't really know that it's them. And it might well be them. It's probably their talent at work, but I think the public needs to have evidence. They like to see you actually do it. Yeah. And then when you can actually do it in front of them, then they think, well, not only that, but I think that sometimes when we do it, we do it better on stage. Yeah. which is actually something that people don't really it, true. True. They don't true. try for anymore. They, if they can get it as good as the record, they're satisfied. But if you, if what we, are, my intention, I'm sure Pete's intention, was always to take it one step further in front of a live audience, you know? Well, somehow to get something out of it yourself. To get something out of it, because that, on that night, it should be special. Yes. How's your aerial? 
Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> it's slipping around the side, but it's right. I'm looking after them. <laughs> As your windmill, you damaged yourself, windmill. Yeah, I did, yeah. I, it's really stupid. I shouldn't really be doing it. I'm much too old to be windmilling. <laughs> it, it's, no, it's very dangerous. And uh, no, the difference is, is that I, I, Eric's guitars have tremolo arms on them. And I, uh, I've never worked with a tremolo arm, not for a long time. No, I don't. Well, this one, this, this Eric Clapton model that I've got has got a tremor. <laughs> Mine has. And, uh, and I, I was swinging my arm a bit rigorously one day and showing off, really. And, uh, and I'd stuck the tremor arm through my hand. But I've had lots of accidents with my hand. Luckily, it was okay. It could have been really bad. Scraped I scraped a couple of nails off as well. I've, I'm always losing fingernails and knocking bits Just off. Just shoes, stuff. you see. When you pass the age of 40, you shouldn't try to do this. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, you're talking about, you but know, you standing... He, he hurt himself playing cricket. I fell off a mud bike and smashed my fingernail playing cricket. Yeah, that is... With Ian Bolton. Sorry huh? to interrupt. Well, sometimes with Ian Bolton, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come on, I want to hear, are you both, I know you're poor, wounded, 44-year-olds, can you play something together first? Oh, we are. No request. We didn't know what to do, so I just, when we arrived, just said, people, I'll play blues, you know, or something, and see what happens. You should okay. do. All right. time you played together. When did you first play together? We don't do it very often, actually. Yeah. I can't remember. We are honest. We are honest. Yeah. Oh, very. Well, when did you first actually meet I don't him? know. I think it was around the marquee, maybe. Do you, he's got a fantastic memory. No, I haven't, so actually. We, I, I, I know when I first saw Eric, because when we, we started to work in the 60s, we were working in kind of isolation, but there were lots of exciting things happening in London. The Stones were working. The yard birds were out there somewhere. There were lots of interesting things happening, lots of interesting blues bands happening. And, and I'd heard about this man who was a myth. Really, Eric Clapton was a myth <laughs> in Richmond where we played, even, even uh, in 1963. You're and I think you'd only been playing for a few years. You were yeah. a yard bird then? Yeah, I'm not, not even a few years. I'm and I remember seeing him on, but, at a bus stop in Ealing Broadway looking very, very... Uh, Posy, I thought. 
A threat. A threat. A definite threat. Yeah. <laughs> but then, of course, in the in the seventies, when you fell foul of drugs, you were mm. a great help, weren't you? Pete actually dug me out of the hole that I was getting deeper into, and uh, I think was actually instrumental in getting me to look at life as a proposition again, because uh, I'd uh, gone into a real hermit-like existence, and without my knowing it, Pete had organised all my old mates, musicians, to put on a concert specifically to get me out of it, to get me back on my feet again, and uh, I carried on after we did the, the, the Rainbow concert, which was that that's what it was all about and then afterwards I carried on but it actually sowed the seed of, um, of optimism back in my mind so it wasn't long after that, that I, I think yeah, I think selfishly I mean I thought it's not that I'm bucking the fact that there were there were a lot of people that really that just missed Eric that was the thing you know, we just missed having him around to sort of kick around <laughs> Uh, but, but no, the, we, I, we, we really missed him, and, and there was this 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 feeling that that, that that was a genuine wasted talent. And I don't I don't know whether anybody really really was that concerned with with the fact that that that, that at that time he had a drug problem or not. Everybody in the music industry at some time or other has had one or is intending to have one. <laughs> <laughs> working on one. Is it? I mean, it is inevitable because I mean the irony is that eight or nine years later, having said that you didn't want to see this wasted talent and you helped it back up, eight or nine years later you felt foul of drugs. I mean, is it, is it an inevitability? I think it's something, I mean, I've heard Eric say that one of the things is, is that you, you tend to pursue a nihilistic route because it feeds you as an artist and I think that there's a certain tendency for that. The drama of pain is something which is, is very, very valuable to an artist. If you're lacking imagination, if you're going through a, a shallow patch, some, some real drama, some real suffering can actually help. The trouble is, is that it does affect everybody else in your life as well. Absolutely. Misery is your inspiration. Isn't no, it? I don't know that 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 is, I think, we pick that up as, as an illusion, as a, you know, I don't really think that that's true. I think, and, it, and anyway, you don't really need, I think when, when you sort of grow up a bit, you don't really need any kind of artificial stimulation, you know, but I think... they are in agony all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> that's true. I mean, so where do you get your kicks from now, then? It's not drugs, it's not drink, you've kicked them both. I actually get my you? kick from playing the guitar. And what, that's probably the most um, stimulating experience and I think that was what I originally got, you know, I was playing, I got a big kick out of playing the guitar and listening to music long before I got into drugs at all, and in fact those things took the edge off it for me, and now that I've put all that nasty stuff behind me, I'm actually rediscovering what I first liked, you know, what I liked in the first place about music, and uh, that's what I get a great deal of But you, you get your kicks now too from fatherhood, no? Yes, very much so. Yeah. A three-year-old. Yes, I have a three-year-old boy. And he, he lives in Italy. He lives in Milan. Yeah. Do, you, do you speak Italian with him? Or? He speaks English. He speaks English. Yeah. Has it, how much has it changed your life? Um, I too much of a gypsy for it to tie me down. I really still uh, kind of pursue the road, you know, and I love to play more than anything else. Even being a father hasn't won't change that. Mm. I mean, all of that stuff will have to be tailored to to meet those ends, because I'm going to be playing until I drop, and, I, yeah. and I, I can't see me retiring at all. Got more and more to give. Yeah. And talking about fatherhood, you're the father of a 20-year-old, an 18-year-old, and another one coming next month. That's it? right, yeah, it's very exciting stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you're looking forward to the nappies? Yeah, I, I, well, I do about the nappies. <laughs> you know, some pain. Yeah, it's going to be good for me as an artist. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to it. I, we we, we, we kind of got broody together, my wife and I, because there were suddenly in our lives there were lots of other friends of ours that had babies, and some of them have actually grown up a bit now, but we've spent the last five or six years watching, playing with other people's babies. And, uh, and got broody. Yeah. But, I mean, do you say to your children, your grown-up children, do you say, never touch the drink, never touch the drugs? Yeah, I, I, I try not to. I try not to say it in quite that way because that's precisely what was a problem yeah, for me. It was being up again, in the it? 60s, I, I, I felt that, that anything anybody told me I shouldn't do, I would do because I felt that it was very, very important to show that we were the generation who were going to change the rules. We weren't going to join up and go and shoot Germans just because somebody told us to. We really are different. I am different. I'm, my f I'm, not, I'm not a rebel particularly, but I'm, my, my, my standards are different. And it's not to say that I don't respect the standards of my father's generation. I do very much. And I, 
And, but but I, I cry when I see the, the Remembrance Day Parade. I cry because I think it's so much senseless waste. And I think that people that told me not to do something, I immediately went and did it on principle. So I don't do that with my kids. I just try to let them know what's really involved, to try to describe what actually happens. But Rock, of course, is now very respectable. It stands for charity. It stands for good causes. No, it's still the same. I mean, there's a whole legion of heavy metal people that are just doing exactly the same I mean, things as we were doing, you know. I mean, it's, it's, it's still pretty much a kind of raunchy business, you know. Yeah. It's only... It's not not, not in Bob Geldof's world, is it? But did you ever think, the two of you, 25 years ago, that you'd sit on a chat show on a Saturday night with some nice velvet armchairs and no. talk about father? You know, I was... He, he was... Uh, <laughs> he said, I thought I'd he be said sitting there. there. <laughs> <laughs> he was the one who was singing about the I want my own show. show. <laughs> you shall have it, my son. Thank you both very well, much happy indeed. Happy to be on Pete your own. Pete Townsend, and Derek Clapton. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> later to play us a new song from a new project of his. But first though, a woman who was a support act for The Who way back in the 60s. More recently, she and her hat made a major impact on Live Aid. Midnight at Ronnie Scott's club, a session with this gentleman.